Okay, Thasuni 2005 from, I believe that's Sri Lanka. Okay, let's go e4, e5. Knight f3, knight c6. And we are facing the scotch d4. Okay, uh, well, obviously here we, we play e takes d4. That's what we do. And the scotch gambit would be bishop c4. And there we go, we're facing the scotch gambit. All right, I guess one thing that we could try to do is I could try to play a bad line of the scotch gambit for black and then try to recover from it. So black has two main approaches in this position. The first is knight f6. And a lot of you guys might know that that leads to e5 and then black has this move d5. That's what I actually play. The other approach is to cling to this pawn on d4 and go bishop c5. This is what we're going to do now. And white's main move is to respond with c3. And that contains a pretty vicious trap, which we're going to fall into deliberately. So the way to play here for black is to go knight f6. And that has a possible transposition to the Italian c takes d4, bishop b4 check. What we are going to do is something that is not advised, and that is d takes c3. As our opponent is thinking, yeah, so she knows the correct approach. Bishop takes f7 check. And this forces our king out of its shell. And the bishop on c5 is picked up with queen d5 check. And white is considered to be clearly better in this line. So that is an instructive blunder. How bad is it for black? It's not as bad as some, I think, books have said. Black is by no means losing, but black is much, much worse. So first order of business is to figure out where we should put our king. Obviously not on g6 or f6. We're going to get mated. The real question is, do we go e7? Do we go e8 or f8? Who can tell me the best square and why? So we should choose the, rel the safest square, relatively speaking. So I think some of you might be saying, okay, so let's think logically. If we go king f8, that allows white to take on c5 with check, so we don't want that. So therefore, we should go king e8. And after king e8, queen takes e5, we have a tempo. What can we do with this tempo? Well, we can take on b2 and preserve our extra pawn, but that's actually flawed logic. The problem there is that even though, yes, you do win a pawn, the bishop comes out to b2, and I, I hope you guys can see how dangerous that becomes. That bishop immediately attacks g7. Black is going to get smothered there. So the point here is not to cling to your extra pawn. It is to make the king as safe as possible. And so the move king f8 is actually the correct one. King f8 is, relatively speaking, a better square for the king. Why is that? Because on e8, the king... So think about it this way. When you play king e8 and then you put the pawn on d6, that pawn on d6 becomes a hook. And white can exploit that hook by pushing e5. And if you think 5-7 moves in the future, that king on e8 might be caught on the crossfire of a vicious attack down the e-file. On f8, it is temporarily safe from anything terrible that might happen on the e-file for the time being. Does that make sense? So here we go, d6, covering the check and opening up our bishop. And when you have a situation like this, your king is weak, you have to first and foremost develop as quickly as possible and as actively as possible to give yourself a little bit of time that you can then use to, for instance, castle by hand. So what should we start with? And my headphones died. What should we start with? Yeah, so we should start with knight f6. We should start with knight f6. That hits the pawn on e4. And then this bishop could come out to g4. And in such situations, you, you should always be aware of the eventual plan of castling by hand, moving the king back up to f7, swinging the rook to f8 or e8, and then tucking the king back to g8. Unfortunately, the immediate king f7 is bad. Who can tell me why? Why can't we go king f7 here and then move the rook aside? Because of knight g5, very nice. So logically, what move comes to mind? I'm not saying that this is the best move, but it is a candidate move. What can we try? Yeah, we can play h6 first. Now you might say, well, doesn't h6 weaken the g6 square? You know, can't white play something like knight h4? Yes, white can, but then we go king f7, and that square is going to be protected. Let's give it a shot. Let's go h6. I'm not developing the light squared bishop because I feel like castling by hand is the top priority here. If we can squeeze that in, everything else is going to fall into place. Now, a very skilled opponent 
is is going to find a way to deter us from from doing this. But let's see if she's up to the task. So king f7. And then another point of not developing the bishop is that if our opponent gives us a queen check on either of these squares, we can cover it with our bishop. Very important detail, without which this wouldn't work. Hopefully everything is making sense so far. b3, that is not a particularly scary move, and it seems like we will accomplish our first aim. Now, where should we go with this rook? Should we go to f8 or should we go to e8? And you could make a case for both, but what's the more natural move? Yeah, the more natural move is to go to e8, because at least the rook is doing something there. It's pressuring the pawn. And our opponent, I like what she's doing. She's going to put the bishop on b2. That's going to create a battery, and that's going to immobilize the knight on f6. Nonetheless, we have accomplished something very serious. Our king is now a lot safer than it was on f8. But we're still worse. Why are we worse? Well, first of all, white's got a very nice pawn on e4, which could potentially advance to e5. And of course, the main reason that we're worse is because of this battery. This battery is a permanent strain on our position. It doesn't allow our knight to move. And if this knight is eliminated, then we're going to have to deal with very serious threats along the diagonal. Okay. How should we continue? Well, there's a couple of approaches we could take, but I think the time has come for us to complete our development. I think the time has come for us to complete our development. Uh, what does that mean? What move does that entail? Yeah, knight e5 is another candidate move, trying to put more stuff on that diagonal. I'll explain after the game why I think it's a bad move. Or why why I think it's not, not the right approach. Yeah, bishop g4. Alternatively, we could play bishop e6, but let's try to play with maximal activity. And so that means bishop g4. So I was asked to explain king g8. The point of king g8 is just to physically get the king as far away from harm as possible. If you think about it, when the king sits on f7, it's a lot more susceptible to all sorts of tactics, right? Knight g5, knight e5. If the center opens up, it's closer to the center physically. The further away the king is from the center, the safer it is as a rule of thumb. That's why you castle in the first place. Because it's far harder to open up the king's side and get your pieces to the king's side than it is to get your pieces to the center. Okay, what do we do now? Queen c2 is an interesting move. This, I guess, opens up the bishop. And I suppose there are a couple of things that we could do here. Um, the simplest idea is probably to connect our rooks. We should probably get this queen out of d8 and put it on a, a somewhat more active square. So there is a little maneuver that I'm thinking about. Where do you guys think we should park our queen? Not on the next move, but ultimately. What's, an, what's a nice square for the queen? And be very careful, because if you go queen d7, we allow bishop takes f6, and our pawn structure is ruined. I don't know if I'm prepared to allow that. I don't know if I'm prepared to allow that. So what should we start with? We should start with queen e7. And eventually, yeah, so eventually we should get our queen to f7. That's the square I'm looking at. Not g6, but f7. Why f7? Because from f7, the queen controls the knight on f6. It controls the f file, and it allows the rooks to breathe. And it's also just physically provides protection to the king. So let's start with queen e7. Now you might be thinking, well, am I not worried about e5? I am worried about e5. That's a worrisome move. But I think we'll be able to survive the impact. I think we'll be able to trade and then move the queen aside. And I just don't see that that's that dangerous. Yeah, I think it's... Yeah, she's playing very, very well. But I think so far we're... We're doing decently in terms of recovering. JTD, thank you so much. You are the freaking man. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. For those watching on YouTube, we had an absolute sub explosion this stream. JTD gifted 569 subs in one stream. So that's why I'm freaking out about it. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Okay, have a great night. Thank you, Leonard, for the prime. Not done. <laughs> More subs. Yeah, I know he's easy. It's crazy. So our opponent is contemplating our next move. Um, we will put the queen on f7, and then ultimately, how can we continue improving our position? 
Well, we can potentially double on the E file. Knight D4 is a great move. It, it gets the knight out of the purview of the bishop. And now the bishop kind of just looks dumb on G4, just shooting into thin air, right? So knight D4 is an impressive move. Now, we should probably trade. We should probably trade. Because if we don't trade, then we're going to lose a pawn. And a lot, some of you might be thinking about knight e5, but as I just explained in the last game, knight on e5 is often unstable, and it can be chased away with f4. Why would we want to allow that, right? So let's take. Yeah, De, uh, De Tangsta asks, if you to look at this position fresh, what factors into your evaluation? I'll explain that more carefully after the game. Like, why? how do I know that white is better here? Even though I kind of talked about that a little bit. All right, now there's there are some issues that we're facing here. If we follow through on our plan, if we play queen f7, who can tell me what nasty response white has to that move? Queen f7 allows something we don't want to allow. Now think about type two undefended pieces and pawns. This pawn on c7 is a type two. It's protected by the queen. The queen is actually overextended right now because it's defending the knight and protecting the pawn and so bishop takes f6 is a positional threat. That would essentially force g takes f6. So then you might be saying, well, that means we have to defend our c-pawn. So should we go rook a c8? Well, no, right? We don't necessarily want to tie down an entire rook. Can we do it in a more economical manner? We can go c5. But I would argue that c5 really weakens the d6-pawn. Yes, it, it's with tempo, but we're going to have that permanent weakness on d6. I think c6 is a better idea because... Why isn't this still a weakness? It is still a weakness, but now it's far more realistic that, and, and far more likely that we'll be able to go d5. So it isn't in such positions when you're struggling, when you're worse, it's, you know, you don't want to fall in love with moves with tempo, right? c5 is a classic case of one move itis. Yeah, you attack the bishop, but you're creating more permanent weaknesses. I'm not saying c5 is a terrible move. I think it's maybe almost as good as c6, but I think this is a little bit safer because it creates the possibility of going d5. In fact, d5 is almost a threat in this position. e takes d5, we can take the rook. Okay. So let's see what our opponent comes up with here. I think the best approach for white would be probably to go f3 or h3 and then maybe activate this knight on c4. Another great move would be rook e3. The move I'm really worried about is rook e3. Lifting the rook up to g3. Okay, so h3 happens. h3 happens. Okay. Now I suppose we move our bishop. Where should we move it? Bishop h5 is one possibility. But I think it's safer to keep your pieces uh, closer to the center, maybe clustered together so that they control more important squares. If you think about it, okay, so the knight wants to go to c4. I don't know why you guys are, are thinking about bishop d7. To me, that move looks quite awkward. In fact, it the move bishop d7 will make it harder for us to defend d6. It'll invalidate the move rook at8. Bishop e6, yeah. I, I'm not sure why, you know, why people were deterred from this move, but I think bishop e6 is the most natural. In fact, it also cuts into the pin, which, which makes it less urgent for us to move the queen aside. Thank you, Chocolate Boy. Yeah, so that's an important point. It blocks the battery. It does, but how should I put it? That's not the most important thing. It's, it's not like we're trying to win the e4 pawn. The e4 pawn is perfectly well defended, right? So yes, it makes the rook temporarily maybe a little bit passive, but we're adopting a defensive posture here. Um, and, and the point is to control as many squares as possible. Okay, so e5. Striking in the center, we have to take that pawn. And then perhaps it might be a good good time to move our queen away from e7. Now bishop h5 was fine, and bishop h5 was also fine, but I think bishop e6 is just a little safer. Queen versus two rooks totally depends on the concrete situation. It can be good, it can be bad, it can be anything in between. There's no general formula on evaluating that. Rook takes e5. Quite clearly, we have to move our queen away. Where should we move it? Where should we move it? And a couple of squares comes to mind. We can play queen d6 and attack the bishop. 
Queen d6 has the advantage of being with tempo. The disadvantage of queen d6 is that the queen is a little bit further from our king than I would like it to be. I, I feel like we should stick to our destination from earlier. I feel like we should play queen f7. That queen just seems really, really solid on that square. That queen just seems really solid on that square. After rook a1, we are still worse. We have definitely not equalized, but we are making progress. Okay. So we're expecting rook a e1. And I just I just feel safer knowing that my queen is is protecting the g7 pawn. And in case that the knight on f6 is traded, in case something like this happens, I hope I'm making logical sense. Just good to keep the queen closer to our king. And by the way, you should notice the presence of opposite colored bishops. What does this tell you? Well, as I've shared several times before, in the end game, opposite colored bishops provide very much drawage tendencies, as you guys know. But in the middle game, opposite colored bishops often favor the attacker. In fact, they produce something opposite to a drawage tendency. They, they make it a lot easier to attack because intuitively, we have nothing with which to control the dark squares. All right, so the natural thing to do here is to move the bishop to d5 and offer a, a trade of rooks. Let's calculate. Bishop d5, rook takes e8 check, rook takes e8, rook takes e8 check, and we run into a small problem. Queen takes e8, and at the end of that line, what do we need to reckon with? What does white have? At the end of the line, bishop takes f6 is possible, but then we play g takes f6, and here's the thing. Because so many pieces have been traded, I'm far less concerned about our pawn structure getting damaged. But what other move does white have in that situation? White also has bishop takes a7. But let's calculate one move further than that. So again, bishop d5, rook takes e8, try to visualize this, rook takes e8, rook takes e8, queen takes e8, bishop takes a7, and what active possibility do we have? No, queen g6 is impossible, the queen controls that square. Your queen is on e8. There are no rooks on the board. I'm talking about black. What can black do there? Queen check. Very good. You can give a check on e1 or you can go queen e2. And it seems to me that the combination of opposite colored bishops together with our activity should give us sufficient compensation to make a draw. And again, I'm, I have to say I'm very impressed with our opponent's play. I mean, she's keeping the pressure and it's quite likely that this game is going to end in a draw. Okay. Now Nanuka says, can't we take with the knight? Yeah, you can take with the knight. You can you can say, I don't want to give this pawn away at all. I take with the knight. The downside of that is that you yield the e-file. And I really, really don't want to give up give our opponent full control of the e-file. Because if the rook ever infiltrates to e7, we're kind of toast. Okay. So we're expecting rook takes e8, and then we're going to have a trade of rooks and an endgame. Queen f5, putting more pressure. That's another really good move. But not as scary as I think it looks. So what should we do? Well, we should try to discharge the tension, right? We have to start trading pieces. The most traditional and the best method of dealing with pressure and dealing with the dubious position is to trade. So we can either tra trade immediately rook takes e5, or some of you are proposing the move knight d7, which essentially forces a queen trade. But knight d7 doesn't work concretely. Knight d7, queen takes queen, and if you take with the king, then after the trade of rooks on e8, notice that that g7 pawn is going to hang. That g7 pawn is going to hang because our knight is no longer on f6. Very good, plus. So therefore, I think it's sensible to take on e5 first. And after rook takes e5, knight d7 is more sensible. It forces the queen trade. And in the end game, White's control of the e-file is going to be far less important and far less concerning. So let's go knight d7. Yeah, she, she correct. I mean, everything that white is doing here is good. 
And the endgame is still going to be slightly worse for us. Why do I say that? Well, because I think White's bishop is a little bit better than our bishop. How do I know that? Well, White's bishop is actually doing more, right? It's, it's pressuring both of these pawns. And White also has control of the e-file, so we have a couple of problems left to solve in the endgame, but we're very, very close to equalizing. Yeah, move order is super important. Like, do you take the rook first or do you not? I think people overcomplicate move order. What you should, the way you should think about it is, you know, different move orders allow different options, right? So, for instance, knight, knight d7, the immediate knight d7, allowed white to take on e8 twice. That was a completely different position. Do not assume that different move orders simply transpose into each other because fre frequently they don't. And that's where the problems happen. Okay. So what should we do now? Well, first, let's let's try to figure out what our opponent's ideas are. Rook f3 is not a problem because our bishop controls that square. Ideally, we would like to solve the problem of our pawns that are located on dark squares and that are pressured by the bishop. So we can either play a6, but let's go full attack mode. Let's go a5. If we're already pushing the a pawn, then we might as well... Um, we might as well try to create some pressure on white's queen side, right? a5, a4, and maybe we can open the a file, and one day, maybe we can attack that b3 pawn. Thank you, Chess Dojo. 94. Very good move. Wow. Okay. That's the move I was worried about, because it essentially forces a trade. And the reason that it forces a trade is because knight d6 is a very, very nasty threat. It would win the b7 pawn. That is unallowable. We have to take that knight. We have to take that knight. Oh, oh, yeah, bishop takes g7. There was rook g8, though. I missed it, but bishop takes g7 here. I think we had rook g8 in response. Okay. So we have a very interesting endgame. It's a bishop versus knight situation. We can certainly contemplate the move a4, but white responds with b4, and that doesn't accomplish much. So what comes to mind here? No, definitely our opponent is playing, you know, high 2000s level, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll we'll take a look at the game for sure. Uh, offer draw, maybe. I, so I don't like c5 or b5. I feel like pushing pawns is just going to create further weaknesses. Also, remember that white is threatening bishop takes g7 here. White is threatening bishop takes g7. And so we can push the g pawn, but I like the move knight f6 here. Rook e8 loses. Rook e8 loses a pawn. Rook takes e8 and bishop takes g7. I like the move knight f6. It offers a trade. The trade is going to be good for us. And that knight is kind of used as a shield, shielding us from the bishop's pressure of g7, right? Okay, so rook f4 is something that I think some of you guys might be concerned with. Um, and... The reason for that is, is why I can follow up with bishop takes f6. But again, you have to remember that in the end game, pawn structure does not work the same way that it works in the middle game. A pawn structure that involves pawns on f6 and h6 would be unthinkable in the middle game because our king would be terribly weak. But in the end game, it's totally fine. In fact, it can even be better to have these isolated pawns than it might be to have consecutive pawns because they can both be defended by the king from a single square. And after the game, I'll show you guys a very interesting example of a situation where it is easier to make a draw when you have a quote-unquote terrible pawn structure than when you have a good pawn structure. So, of course, I'm not saying that we should take g takes f6. Here we should take with a king, but that's just something to keep in mind. And I think we have fully equalized. It took us 29 moves. Now we have an equal and very draw stroke endgame. How should we play it? What should we do? Well, the first step is to activate the rook, right? Our rook is sitting on a8. It's not doing anything. Let's get it to d8. And potentially, let's get it to d5. Let's get it to d5. The other thing we could do is we could start pushing our pawns. We could play b5 and try to create a passer. Our ultimate plan here is definitely to create a passer. b5, c5, c4. But if we push our pawns too fast, then they might become weak and white might win them. So we also could consider playing g5 and, and trying to slow down the progress of white's pawns. Um, let's give b5 a shot. This is an ambitious move. It weakens the c6 pawn, but it might pay off in the end. 
Does the queen side majority mean that? No, pawn end games are very unclear because both sides have an equivalent majority, right? Both sides have a three versus two, which means that pawn any pawn end game is going to depend very directly on, okay, draw is offered, let's play on, which is which means that any pawn end game is going to depend on who uh, who has a better king placement, who has uh, faster probability of creating a passer. Okay. So the move c5 here would be, ooh, there, there, there. The move c5 is very interesting. And I think we can give it a shot. Let me just calculate something. Okay, I'm gonna, let, let's give it a shot, folks. This is a risky move, but it could pay off. Who can tell me why it's risky? What does white have in this position? What nasty little move on the queen side? And anytime you have three pawns arranged like this, neither of them is defending the other, which means that moves that carve out squares become dangerous. White has the move a4. It's not played. Our opponent goes rook e3. Ooh. Okay. So if we play c4, I definitely think that that's premature. Because then after takes, takes, rook c3, our pawn is going to become more of a weakness than a strength. And so I think we should take this opportunity and play a move like g5 in order to slow down the progress of white's pawns. Or, or we could play rook d4. Rook d4 is another good move. The problem with rook d4 is it lets white infiltrate to e8. I would like to start with g5. Let's see what our opponent does here. I think this is going to help in the event of a pawn endgame. It's going to help us slow down the possibility of creating a passer. Now, of course, we have to go rook d5. We have to defend the pawn. And potentially, we can even try to go h5, h4. This is called a deep freeze, right? When two pawns control three pawns. Okay, king e3. So let's go... Our, our opponent wants king e4, but king e4 is not very dangerous because we can give a check on e5. So this might be a good opportunity to play h5. But I also like the idea of centralizing our king. Let's, let's centralize our king. Okay. Now, the problem here is that we cannot move our rook. And we want to move our rook. We want to be able to move our rook. So what move comes to mind? No, b4 is bad. B4 is bad because it because it it disqualifies us from ever creating a pass pawn on the queen side. Rook d1 blunders the pawn. We have to defend the pawn on c5, and that means going king d6. Now, maybe the pawn endgame is winning for white. I don't rule that out. I don't rule out that rook d3 wins for white. I mean, it's going to be very close, and I'm too lazy to calculate it. If our opponent beats us from this endgame, I mean, congrats. <laughs> Hats off. And she's probably calculating it right now. Okay. Let me think. Yeah, this is dangerous. Okay, let's take it and go king e5. Yeah, this is a little, a little bit... I mean... Thinking on king takes t3, I don't know about that. Okay, so king e5, a4, takes, takes, h5, king c4, h4, takes, takes, b5, king e4, king e5, king g4, king g6, king h3, a5, king g2, a6, h3. That could end up being a draw. I mean, this is hard. So king d5, f4, takes, takes, h5, h4. Four takes takes king c3 king e4 takes c4 king takes f4 king b5 king g4 takes takes b6 Ooh, wait a second so let me calculate that again king d5 f4 takes takes c4 b6 there king e3 king e4 takes takes b5 and g4 takes a5 takes h4 six king Wait, now that loses there, there. Okay. 
Okay, let's try king d5. I'll, I'll talk about this after the game, but this is like... We're, we're playing... Uh, yeah, very, very strong. Strong opponent. Okay, f4 is what I thought would happen. Let's take it to go h5. Yes, a C4 check. I thought it, I thought we win this actually. Let's see who calculated correctly. I think we win. Oh my god. Or H4, we win this. We win this. This is a classic. H3, we promote and stop a, a queen. This is exactly as I calculated it. Uh, this is. This is good. This is good stuff. And we, we can get our queen to a. This would be a draw if white's king landed on b8, but the king cannot get to b8. Now, for the record, I do think our opponent is legit, but just obviously very, very clearly highly underrated. Wow. I mean, there, there, look, there, there is a lot of top moves, but there's also a lot of inaccuracies and mistakes. So I just think our opponent is strong and, and underrated. And the move f4 actually loses. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. This is so cool. Oh, my. This end game is so cool. Okay. Well, we'll we have to dig into this. Um, and again, guys, I, I always say this. You know, there's a lot of underrated people on chess.com. Um, there are definitely a lot of cheaters on chess.com. But just be careful about making these accusations. And, you know, sometimes... Even I obviously get suspicious when it's a 1400 and, you know, they're playing on equal terms with me. Yeah, like part of me is like, well, that's weird. At the same time, you know, these longer games, people are capable of finding good moves. And you should always put yourself in the shoes of the person who's playing and saying and say, well, have you ever had a really good game? How would you feel if, you know, 2000 people made up their minds based on five good moves that you played that you're a cheater for sure? I think if you do that if you imagine that you're that person um you know i'm not saying never be suspicious of anybody but you know just try to act based on evidence and you can always plug the moves into a computer anyway sorry for the lecture let's get into the game it's a very sensitive topic because you know suspicion is often is often very well founded but there's also a lot of underrated and strong people so it's a very difficult thing to kind of navigate all right so d4, we have a scotch gambit, bishop c5, c3, and dc3 is a mistake. Um, as far as I know, maybe maybe modern theory has found a way for black to, to get a decent position here, but practically speaking, this is very bad. And, and the move here is knight f6. Sorry, let me reopen the game in an analysis board. So the move here is knight f6. And um, e5, d5, and... You know, stuff happens here. You can explore this on your own. I, I'm not too interested in talking about the opening. Yeah, so Rishadon asks, what happens after queen d5 here? Well, who can tell me? You tell me, Rishadon. There are two pieces that are attacked. So one of the ways to defend against the fork is to ask yourself, well, can one of my pieces defend both of the pieces that are being attacked? The answer here is yes. You can play queen e7. And black is fine because you're going to go knight f6 on the next move and kick away the queen. So bishop f7 is correct. Okay. So again, king e8 is, in my opinion, inferior because the king, you know, is closer to the center and can be caught in the crossfire. So I think I, I explained pretty deeply all of these choices. So let's go pretty quickly through the opening. h6. Again, preparing to castle. Preparing to castle by hand. King f7, rook e8. King g8. There is a question here about the move knight e5. 
why didn't I play knight e5 to, to try to plug the diagonal? The reason is knight takes e5, and you're in a tough spot, because if rook takes e5, well, that rook is not stable. White can go f4. And if pawn takes e5, this pawn becomes a very serious weakness. How can white attack it? White can play either knight c4 or knight f3, and it's going to be very difficult to defend this pawn. And you might have to play a move like this, but already white can play f4. And black's worst nightmare comes true. I mentioned that you can almost never move this knight away from f6. If that happens, you're going to be in big trouble. Okay, another question. Weren't you afraid of queen b3 check before white played b3? Yeah, so queen b3 check is a move that I was a little worried about, and I fully intended to sacrifice a pawn had white played this. And then, for instance, we can go queen d7. And I would argue that, yeah, I'm sure white is better. White can evacuate the queen through b5. But at the very least, we've gotten a lot of moves in uh, in the time that white has spent evacuating her queen. You know, we can go rook e8. We can go rook b8. And I think black has a very decent position. There is some compensation. A little compensation, yeah. How important is being a pawn at, down a pawn at this level? Um, not that insurmountable. I mean, anywhere 20... 2,000 and under as a rough number, you know, being down upon, and I'm not talking about a pawn endgame, obviously. Uh, being down upon, let's say, in the opening or early middle game is really not not a big deal, not something to, to fret about. But you shouldn't fret about it if you're a GM either, right? Once you blunder, you just have to accept it and, and try to make the most of it. Thank you, Lazan. So maybe Queen B3 was best. You can check this with a computer. Did I see 22,000? 2,200. So bishop b2, bishop g4, queen drops back to c2, we go queen e7. Again, the point is to get our queen to f7. Knight d4 is a very nice move. Now we play c6. Again, c5 would end up weakening the d6 spawn quite severely. Um, queen c4 check, there was also bishop e6. Okay, so h3, bishop e6. Now here... Um, Bishop h5, how do I explain this? I just feel like this bishop is uh, a little bit neither here nor there. It's just sort of sitting on a weird square. It's not really controlling any of the light squares in the center. The move knight c4 becomes easier to play. Does that make sense? White can go g4 potentially. I just feel like this bishop could, could end up getting in the way. I don't think it's a big difference though. Um, so does bishop f5 work here? No, he takes f5. And Remember that white has made some luft, and also white can go knight f1. And a queen and a piece for two rooks is way too much of a price to pay. Okay. So, bishop e6. And somebody asked me the question, how do I know that white is better? As I indicated, the main reason is that you have this monster bishop on d4. And if you think about it, white's control over the dark squares is more impressive than black's control over the light squares because white has the possibility of going e5. White is aimed at black's king. Black isn't really aimed at white's king. And in addition, there's just differences in piece placement. White has this pawn on e4. White's got a nice rook behind it. Black's a little bit more passive in the center. These combination of things is exactly what gives white the advantage. That's what the advantage consists of. It's, you know, relatively small factors that taken together result in a nasty position. Okay, why is c5 not brutal? What do you mean? For who? Like, why is it not that bad? I'm not sure what you're asking. For white? Well, because of bishop b2, right? White just drops the bishop back. I'm not sure what... Why did you think this was brutal for white? Yeah, then black has a weakness on d6. Right, a bigger weakness than if you play c6. So that's the point. Um, so c6, h3, bishop e6, e5. I think e5 is an inaccuracy. I think this was premature. I think that white should have just gone rook a d1 and made small improving moves and maybe going f4. Okay, so d e5, rook takes e5, queen f7, dropping the queen away from the pin. Then we have this mass trade. So again, if we go knight d7 immediately, um, queen takes f7 is very unpleasant. I mean, either we have to lose the a-pawn or we have to lose the g-pawn. In this case, we lose the g-pawn. There's a trade on e8, and then bishop takes g7. And if bishop takes f7, then there's rook takes e8, and another bad choice. If bishop takes e8, then rook e7. If rook takes e8, then white wins a7. And 
you might be thinking, well, wait a second, doesn't b6 trap the bishop? But what you have to understand about this construction is two things. First of all, this bishop is totally unassailable. It cannot be, cha it cannot be attacked. In order to attack, a black needs to get the king all the way around, which gives white plenty of time to extricate the bishop. And white has several ways of doing that. The simplest is to go knight c4. But who can tell me what the alternative way of getting this bishop out of a7 is? If knight c4 didn't exist, if black had a bishop on f7, let's say, let's say, let's say we had this position, what should black do here? What should white do here? Yeah, white should start with a4, and then white should go b4, and then a5, essentially trying to get to this b6 pawn. Okay. So for that reason, we take the rook first, and then go knight d7. And let's fast forward all the way to the pawn endgame, because I think at this point, everything I was doing is quite obvious. Knight f6, we have a trade. We activate the rook. We start pushing the pawns. We start pushing the pawns. Now, what's important to realize, I mean, a lot of you were proposing the move before. Why is b4 bad? It's because it creates a deep freeze situation, where the pawn on b3 is freezing both of these pawns, not allowing them to progress. Does that make sense? And... Of course, you want to preserve the ability to create a pass pawn here. I mean, why else are we pushing these pawns? But before that, what was I planning against a4? Here, I was planning a tactical response without which I think black is in serious trouble. Who can find it? So the, the drawback of a4 is that it, it weakens the b3 pawn, and that allows black to have this nice tactic with c4. And if a takes b5, then black wins connected passers and this is unstoppable so white should go here but now we play b takes a4 we're threatening to push this pawn so white should probably go c5 and now we can play the the cold-blooded move rook c8 the point being in the event of a trade only black can win obviously because we are the ones with an outside passer this should be a draw but that's unpleasant for white right so this is the line i calculated our opponent went rookie three we took this opportunity to freeze up white's king side pawns. Rook c3, rook d5, king e3, king e5. g3 was a nice move because this essentially prevents any h5, h4 shenanigans. So again, here, b4 is a knee-jerk reaction, very bad move because it only gives white a blockading square and it makes it so much harder to push these pawns. King activity is not something that, you know, you can retreat your king in endgames. And end games, just like in middle games, you have to be very concrete. You know, you have to be goal oriented. A goal here is to free up this rook. We want to be able to go rook d1. We want to be able to go rook d4. So we have to protect c5. At rook d3, I failed to properly consider. I checked very briefly with the engine. It looks like this is a draw. But then there were several mistakes. So the one thing I can tell you, so we trade... We go king up to d5. This is pretty obvious. Now, what other options were at our disposal? Well, how was I even thinking about this pawn endgame? Let me try to paint this from a general perspective to help you guys understand how I was able to gear my calculation in the right direction, even though I ended up making a mistake. So this is kind of an archetype. This type of pawn endgame is an archetype. It's, it's, it's a pawn race archetype. How do I know that there's going to be a pawn race? Well, there's very likely going to be a situation where both sides create a passer, and then both kings end up going to opposite flanks to pick off the pawns. And then at the end of the day, the question is going to be whose corner pawn is going to be faster. I'm sure you guys have seen these types of situations before. How do I know that both sides will create a pass pawn? Well, because both sides have a relatively symmetrical pawn majority. So black's going to go c4 at some point, and white's going to go f4 at some point. Now, the point is to create that pass pawn, to, to set yourself up as successfully as possible for the pawn race. What does that mean? What does that entail? First of all, that means not pushing your passer prematurely. If you push your passer and if you create a passer prematurely, that pass pawn could end up being weak. And you might have to end up, you know, saddling your king with the task of defending that pawn. So we start with the move king d5, activating the king and, of course, preparing c4. Our opponent responds with f4, which apparently is the losing move. And after g takes f4, g takes f4, how do I explain the move h5? h5 is a move that prepares us for the pawn race. Again, I'm thinking of the future, and in the future, 
I'm thinking of a situation where both kings end up taking corner pawns. Why does h5 make sense? Who can explain that to me? Why, why is it good to induce h5, h4? That's your queen. This is our queen, and this literally just pushes the pawn closer to promotion so that when we take this pawn, we're going to have an extra tempo. In fact, that is exactly what happened. It's not really about waiting moves. It's if, if possible, we would have pushed our pawn all the way to h4. Now, amazingly, the winning move here was b4. It, it, or so it appears. Let me open the analysis and we'll analyze this with an engine. Okay, so we have this situation. Our opponent goes f4. No, maybe it is a draw. Now, when you're analyzing pawn endgames with the engine... Uh, remember that this kind of evaluation, minus 0.45, can be very misleading because essentially it's either a win or a draw. There's very seldom going to be something, quote-unquote, in between. So what minus 0.45 might mean is that the computer sees that there's going to eventually be a transition into a queen endgame where both pawns promote simultaneously and maybe black has an extra pawn. Hence the, quote-unquote, slight advantage. But generally... This evaluation really means nothing because pawn endgames are essentially deterministic, right? They can be calculated to the very end. Does that make sense? So increasing depth is important. This is at depth 20. That's enough for us because we're going to make moves. But take this with a grain of salt. So GFGF is logical. And now it says that B4 is the winning move, which is crazy to me. Because this seems so counterproductive, like it actually prevents us from going to c4. My guess is there might be some sort of a Zugzwang situation here. So let's see. First of all, if white plays f5, we actually lose if we go king e5. And again, we have a pawn race. Takes, takes here, here, here. And this is exactly what happened in the game, except with colors reversed. Because we have to move our king aside. And just like in the final scene of searching for Bobby Fischer... White promotes and stops black from promoting. I mean, this is easy to follow, right? This is very concrete. And so for that reason, once again, what the computer is saying is rather than going for this pawn immediately, we need to make, we need to take care of our future selves. We need to start by making this extra move, and that's going to give us that extra tempo in the pawn race. Okay, so if white plays h4, then we go king e5, we get the exact same pawn race with an extra tempo, and black wins. And the same thing, f6 is more resilient because this pushes black's king further away, but it still doesn't help. Takes, takes, here, 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 takes, takes, yeah, and the rest is easy. Takes, takes. So b4, um, we talked about f5, now h5 is brilliant. f6, king e6, king c4, takes, takes, king g5. And the rest is easy, right? Takes, takes. Now, in such situations, you don't want to go to G2 uh, because you, you run into promotion with check anywhere but G2. You want to go here. And this is winning. Again, by a single tempo. I mean, isn't this amazing? And it's all because of this move H5. Not rushing to go after White's pawn, but setting yourself up for a successful pawn race. Now, White doesn't have to go F5. In fact... I was sort of out of the corner of my eye worried about the move king e3. What happens here? Well, again, it makes sense to go h5. If white does nothing, then we go h4. And after king e3, we actually push c4 anyway. And this is a, a classic scenario where we have the outside passer, so we're going to force white's king back to the queen side. Our king is going to go around and take white's pawns. And the reason that white doesn't promote is because we stop the pawn. And we're just faster. In fact, we're faster by only one tempo. Takes, takes, f6. Oh, and this is amazing. Look at this. So if you play b2, there is simultaneous promotion in a draw. What do we have to do? This is like a study. You go king e6, force the king to g6. If you do a lot of puzzles on chess.com, you'll see this theme. And now you play b2 and b1 with a check. Amazing. So white's king cannot cannot go to the king side, which means it has to go here, and that means we win the pawn race very straightforwardly again. <sighs> Jesus. So for that reason, it would make sense for white to go h4 and try to stop black's pawn from progressing, but we still go c4. 
And it's essentially the same exact theme. The important part is that these pawns run very, very quickly. Nothing changes after f5, king, d5. In a, in a certain way, this helps black because it, it's easier now to capture this pawn. And again, we have the same old pawn race. Sorry, we have the same old pawn race where black wins by a single tempo, much like in the game. Okay. So the winning move, I mean, this is incredible. This is very, very instructive. Was b4. This just shows you how irrational pawn endgames can often be. And the mechanism is that this is Zugzwang. This is actually Zugzwang. F5, there's king e5. And if the king moves, then it allows c4. If white could pass, white would actually be winning. It's, it's a situation of mutual Zugzwang. Let me create a situation where it's black to move there. No, it's still a draw. But, you know, white's kind of in charge here. So you might be asking at this point, why was h5 a mistake? And amazingly, according to the computer at a low depth, white had an only move to draw, and that was a4. Okay, so the point is b takes a4, b takes a4. The point is exactly the same as the point of h5. White simply pushes the pawn preemptively as far as it'll go. White sets herself up for the pawn race as well. We play h4, and this turns out to be a draw. Let's see how. King takes c5, king f4, king b5. Oh, but it's not to go here. No, that's actually not the idea. Now you follow black's king to the king side and you get this position. And this is a draw. And the reason this is a draw is because black can uncage our king. We can uncage our king. We can go h3, but this is still a draw. And we have another race. This time it's a race to the king side. But white makes it in time, d2, and by a single tempo, king c1, and you guys know that this is a draw. King b1, and after king a2, there's king c2. And that is just so instructive. Now, why is a4 necessary? Well, the reason it's necessary is because here, if we play c4 check, then white does, in fact, go for the pawn race, and this is where the point of a4 shines through. This is a draw. And this is a draw. In fact, black is the one who's got to be, well, no. Here, here, here. And of course, this is a theoretical draw. But black had to go king g2. This is an exception to the rule. If you try to play king g3 and say, well, I'm going to put my king on a square where white isn't able to promote with check, this is counterproductive because the black king is not able now to reach g1. Um... So, so many cool ideas. And so the move a4, it appears, drew the game. And if c4 check, then takes, takes, king c3. Yeah, that's what we just talked about. So black's best attempt after a4 is to go ba4, ba4, h4, and force white to find this incredible idea of taking this pawn and then pursuing black's king back to the king side. So our opponent played h4, and this is already losing after c4 check. This is losing because the pawn race is lost. And if white goes king e3, we have several ways to win. The simplest being king e6, now c3, forcing the king back. And this is just as in the game. The pawn race wins for black. King c3, king e4. And this is what I had, this is what I was calculating when I entered the pawn endgame. Like I just I kept calculating and recalculating this because if you make a single mistake in your evaluation of the pawn race, and even people like Magnus have made this mistake before. It's going to go from a win to a loss. It's literally tempo for tempo. So that is why pawn endgames, you know, to me are the most fascinating type of endgame because you get these ideas and it's just one endgame. There's endgames that are far more complex than this one. Well, yeah, I just showed she could have drawn. Her last opportunity to draw was a4. It was, in fact, the only move, a4 in this position. What's hopefully, I mean, you guys have to know queen versus pawn end games. The rule is that corner pawns and bishop pawns are drawn, corner pawns and bishop pawns are drawn. Um, and the, the reason why is that, well, let me show it really quickly just to round it off with, with certain exceptions. With certain exceptions, this is a draw, is what I'm trying to say. 
white is going this way. The reason this is a draw, and normally, what is the approach to winning when the pawn is in the center? The point is that you keep checking, force the king to go behind the pawn, and then you inch your king closer and closer to the pawn. You repeat the process as many times as it takes. So you start with a move like queen e4 check, and one way or another, you zigzag your way toward the pawn. Boom, boom, boom. And this is what you do when white is the d pawn. The problem is that with a bishop pawn or with a corner pawn, the king hides in the corner. This is not a capability that white has with the d pawn. The queen takes e7 to stalemate, and black can make no progress. And if you imagine that the pawn was on a7, it would be exactly the same situation. The queen is unable to approach the pawn any further without causing stalemate. And so you have to move the queen away, and white moves the king back to b8, and there's just nothing that can be done. There's just nothing that can be done. So if you shift the pawn to the d-file, then the win is very simple. Queen c6 check it. This is not stalemate. The king has a8. And so the procedure is, you know, you move your king up, and then, in fact, the fastest, who knows what the fastest way to get the king under the pawn is for black. Hint, it's not a check. This is just something that's good to know. The, the black's best move here is not a check. It's queen back to c7, and after king e8, you give this check, and now the queen is very, very close to zigzagging back to d6. King, king up. Here, here, this is the best procedure. Boom. And you guys should be able to see the pattern. And eventually, you have several ways to win. I mean, the simplest is queen e6, and then king back to d6, and you've won the pawn. Now, you might be asking, is a corner pawn drawn in all circumstances? And the answer to that question is no. The, the corner and the bishop pawn um, can, can still be winning for the side with the king. And let me give you guys a good illustrative example of that. Under which circumstances, you might be asking, is a corner pawn still losing? Well, this is one of those circumstances. Seems like a corner pawn situation. Black's king is not that close. And yet Black's king is close enough uh, to do a very thematic win. What essentially Black has to do is allow promotion, and then Black still corners White's king and queen. The simplest move here is king b5. White promotes, you give a check. The king, king c8 is, most, is the most resilient move. How should black continue here? The point is that if king b8, then king b6, and white has no checks. This is pretty awesome, actually. And black's queen dominates. King c8. Now, if you go king b6 here, then white does have a check, and white saves the game. So again, the zigzag maneuver does the trick. Check check and only now you go king b6 the white queen is dominated there's no checks and mate happens in the next move the, the best attempt here is queen c6 check if you find yourself in this position do this but of course king takes c6 wins not queen takes c6 that's stalemate so the same by the way can happen with a bishop on so in certain situations where the king is close enough it is still winning but you know, whether or not it's winning really depends on exactly where the king is. Okay, uh, I think that's enough. <laughs> I think that's enough. See you guys tomorrow. Thanks again.